Everyone has a story to tell. Welcome to Dingo Talk, where we explore the experiences that make us who we are. Here's your host, Carlo Guadagnino. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino, and welcome to Season 4 of Dingo Talk. Uh, my guest this week is the head football coach of DePaul, that would be Brett Dietz. Um, but before we get into talking with Coach, we figured we should grow a little bit as a show. Uh, so this season, at the beginning here, we're going to give you uh, some information about the school that we're talking about. And then we're going to give you a reminder. And we're going to give you the website where you can find all this information out at. So DePaul University is in Greencastle, Indiana. They have about rough, just over 1,700 students. Uh, they have a 65% acceptance rate and an 84% graduation rate. Uh, the cost before aid is about $72,000. Uh, after aid, they figure the average is about $22,000. It's a private liberal arts college. The three majors, the top three majors that they're graduating from last year are econ majors, communication majors, and computer science majors. Uh, with a close on that last one, biochemistry was right in there as well. Uh, a reminder for the parents and recruits that most of your admissions offices are going to have specific people for your specific region, so make sure you talk to them. Uh, the coaches that are recruiting you probably have this information as well or can get you this information or the person that can get you the information. Um, and if all else fails, you can go to the school's website. DePaul's website is www.depaw.edu. Uh, that's D-E-P-A-U-W for DePaul. Uh, coach Dietz is the head football coach of DePaul University of the NCAC. Uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, his coaching journey, uh, first as a player and then getting into his time as a coach. And then we're going to talk about the past three seasons, Nine and three, nine and two, ten and one. Uh, we're going to talk about the trip to Italy that they took last year, which is a big draw for DePaul University. It's a lot of travel for their students. Um, but that being said, you know what time it is. It's time to hear from Coach Dietz. So here we go. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carla Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. It's actually the first episode of season four. We are joined by the head football coach of DePaul University. Uh, Coach Brett Dietz. Coach, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm glad we could get this this down this time. Um, I'm going to do this the same way I do every year or every week. I'm going to take you back in the time machine to your time as a player, and we're going to work our way back forward to where we are today. So my first question for you is why and how do you find yourself at Hanover? Great question. Um, Great question. Take me back to my high school days. I played for a really good uh, program, a, a storied program in Northern Kentucky named Covenant Catholic High School. Um, it's a great school, um, a lot of history and tradition there. Um, and, uh, you know, I was playing quarterback, um, ended up playing a little bit early in my career, but there was some older guys there. So I ended up playing. Uh, we won our state championship as a sophomore mm-hmm. and uh, my junior and senior year uh, was a starting quarterback there and and ran a pro style offense. And um, it was very successful for what we had. But didn't have as much success uh, my, my last two years as we did my sophomore year. And so when I was looking at for colleges, I really wanted to go to a place where uh, where we had a kind of a winning tradition and and I wanted to win. Uh, that was for sure. And I wanted to throw the ball a little bit more than we did in high school. Um, and so I was recruited by Hanover College, which is only about an hour and 15 minutes from my house. Love the coaches, love the campus, love everything it stood for. Uh, being liberal arts, I think, really fit me and, and what I was looking to do. Mm -hmm. I was looking to study so found my my way to Hanover so um, that's how I got there and wasn't just a you weren't just a one sport athlete if you're if if what I read was right you were a four sport athlete while you were at at Hanover now how does that the time management thing's got to be huge for you yeah that that was not an all four year kind of thing Uh, football was definitely my main sport I also played baseball uh, my first year Um, and then after uh, my sophomore year um, where I only basically played one sport. Um, I ended up joining the golf team shortly after that. Um, and so I played. And at the time, you know, I was at at Hanover from 2000 to 2003, mm-hmm. or 04, I graduated in. We didn't have spring ball. 
um, at the end of that. In fact, my the the year between senior year or uh, junior year and senior year was the year they let you do spring ball, but you couldn't use a ball. Um, and so basically we became cross country runners, uh, for that one spring. So, you know, me playing golf, I, I didn't really miss that much football. I still went all the lifts and still went to all the, the running and stuff like that. So it was, it was a much lower key thing, um, at Hanover. And then my junior year, the coaches asked me to come out and play basketball that year. Um, they only had two upperclassmen on the whole team and wanted me to be n- another upperclassman. And mm-hmm. we had a really good group of, of young kids. We ended up making it all the way to the elite eight um that year um but i just warmed the bench for him mainly so uh, provide a little bit of leadership a little bit of older voice kind of in the room uh, but that was kind of only a one-year deal so technically i did letter in 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 four different sports there but really football was my main one well and and football after college was still a, a pretty prevalent part of your life as you go into the afl uh had a pretty good first first go round as the co-rookie of the year and and such talk to us about that experience and what what arena ball was like at that point yeah so um right when I was getting done at uh Hanover um I had uh, some great coaches there uh my offensive coordinator my senior year was Terry Peebles who had played in Germany Mm -hmm. um overseas and so he said hey there's an opportunity if you don't have a full-time job yet or whatever um to go over there and, and play in Europe and you know, live in Europe for free and, and get paid to do it while you're over there. And you're not going to bring back a lot of money, but it could be a great experience kind of as you're graduating. So um, we found a team in Finland that was willing to take me and my teammate, um, Scott mm-hmm. Power. So um, so we both went over there together and spent the summer in, in Finland and got back and started working in radio. That's what I studied, communication. So I was getting into radio um, and those kind of things. And we just had a local arena team pop up named the Cincinnati Marshals that happened to be popped up that year. Um and so I was lucky enough that they wanted to kind of sign me and, and uh, you know, there, there was a little, they were talking about possibly signing Jared Lorenzen, who was a former Kentucky quarterback. I ended up winning a uh, Super Bowl with the Giants, but he was technically still under contract with the Giants, even though he didn't report to the Giants. So I kind of got the nod uh, there, uh, which that kind of helped me out. And so we had a great year there. Um, one of the coaches from the storm, uh, Dave Ewart happened to see one of our games there and liked how I was playing. Um, and so I got signed to the practice squad in 2006 uh, for the Tampa Bay Storm. Um, mm-hmm. But ultimately, being on practice squad, you don't play a lot. You know, you don't travel to the games. You're just on practice squad. So I elected actually to leave um, the Tampa Bay Storm in 2006. Went or uh, in 2007, went down and played for the Louisville Fire in the Arena Two Football League um, for for that season. Um, we did yep. well. We didn't win the championship, but we we did well. I won Rookie of the Year in the Arena Two Football League which allowed me a couple opportunities at the next level. And so I spent, was it at that 2007 years with three different franchises mm-hmm. um, and ended up in Tampa Bay and ended up winning co-rookie of the year at the end of that year. So, um, but at that time, you know, that was really something that, that I aspired to get into. I thought my, my football game really uh, was beneficial for the arena football game. I was not the fastest of, of foot. So being a pocket passer, it was really accurate knew what the defense was doing, but didn't have an overly strong arm. I think um, the arena football league fit me the best. Um, and so that's where my dreams kind of went towards that versus the the CFL, you know, once mm-hmm. the NFL dreams are kind of over. So um, so I gravitated towards that. But at the time, you know, the, the starting quarterback of the Philadelphia soul was making, you know, close to $170,000 um, at the time per year. So I was like, hey, this is a way for me to make a pretty good living uh, if I could if I could get into that and do that. And, uh, you know, so one rookie of the year in 2007 and 2008 signed a new contract. And right at the end of that year between, oh, uh, 2008, 2009, it was kind of when the financial crisis was happening and the arena league ended up, uh, going into bankruptcy that year. So I got mm-hmm. in there, uh, made some really good money there for a year or two, uh, before the players union kind of collapsed and, and the league came back in 2010, but there was no players union, you know, the contracts went way down and. I ended up playing one more year um, just to kind of get the, the the playing bug kind of out of me. Um, and so I played one more year um, in 2010 and made it all the way to the championship game. And, and ironically the, the next weekend I was actually at DePaul in my first uh, coaching gig, but I was, I was just a part-time receivers coach, but in the arena football league, since we played in the spring, you know um, you know, playing in the spring allows you to do something in the fall. So mm-hmm. a lot of the arena guys were coaching at high schools or colleges 
um, in the falls. And so I coached a couple years of high school football. I coached at Marion University in 2007, their first year there. Um, so I, I had coaching experience. I had a taste of it, just not a full time year round deal. So once I hopped to DePaul in, in 2010, um, I coached that season um, and that following uh, spring had a full time opening pop open. So I was lucky enough to get that. Um, and really, I've, I've kind of been here ever since. Well, and so I guess my question is for you, what got you? what gave you the coaching bug? Cause you still had the playing bug going on. Obviously you don't play until the spring. Was it yeah. just the fact that mental mentality wise, it was, you were so used to the fall as football season. So you wanted to be around the game or you just wanted to get, be around it in any way. For sure. I think I just wanted to be around it. And obviously the fall is football time and us playing in the spring. Uh, but it was a way for us to stay in shape. Uh, mm -hmm. Arena football players to kind of stay in shape, still be surrounded by football um, and for me, I just, I love working with, with, uh, you know, high school athletes and, and college athletes and that age, um, you know, I, I, I really kind of am drawn to that age. So, you know, being able to, to develop young kids and hear the coaching. And now I had a little bit of expertise. I'd played in college, had played a little bit professionally. You know, I found that they were really looking to me, um, as, as kind of an expert in that thing. And so I, I just kept increasing, surrounding myself with good coaches, um, kind of building up that coaching pedigree. And I ultimately didn't know if I ended up wanting to coach, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for the rest of my life. But, um, you know, it was just a way to be around football. I love football. I'm a football junkie. And so, you know, those off seasons spent just around football and, and getting around different coaches and learning more and, and getting a little bit more involved in the coaching and still keeping my arm in shape. Obviously, we're all big parts of that as well. Now, in 2010, why was DePauw the 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 destination i mean obviously that's a big jump from from the high school level and you were at the college level for for you said mariana's first year right so why De, why was the was that just an opening and that you knew someone that that there was a connection there how did you end up finding yourself at DePaul? yeah so i owned a house in avon indiana which is only about 40 minutes away from campus and so mm -hmm. i had a buddy actually the same buddy i went over to overseas with scott power um, he had had some contact with the DePaul coach and they were saying, Hey, uh, DePaul's looking for a part-time receivers coach. And he said, Hey, I may have a guy. And so he gave me a call and said, Hey, DePaul's looking for a guy. It's, it's not too far from where you live. You know, you should think about taking this. And I didn't really have any aspirations once I had gotten done to kind of go in that I wanted to kind of go into business or stuff like that. But, um, you know, I was in the banking world at that time because the last season of Arena, when you weren't making that much, everybody had to get kind of a different job. So I got into retail banking and, you know, I wasn't in love with that. And so I said, hey, maybe maybe this is something that I should I should, you know, really look at doing. And, mm -hmm. you know, at that time, you know, you're you're 28, 29 years old. A lot of your other buddies had gotten a business and they would kind of, you know, gained some expertise in some areas and were kind of moving up their companies. Well, meanwhile, I was kind of starting over in the business world at day one, at square one, you know, and I didn't have any ex experience in a lot of these other places. But what I did have experience in was football. And so I was like, well, maybe I should take something that I'm really experienced in it and keep keep doing this thing. And so um, so I ended up taking that part time role. So I worked at the bank in the morning um, in the morning and then, you know, would leave um, and go and start at DePaul, maybe at one and kind of work through the rest of the day and at practice and a little bit after practice and. I said, man, this is real. This is around. This is a lot of fun. If I could do this full time, I, I'd love to do this full time. And then I was lucky enough after the season, I went back to banking um, and started working there full time. And then when that position came up in the spring, I was really excited. You know, I, that was something I was excited about. Was not super excited about going to the bank every day. So um, it just kind of it, it was a, a stroke of luck that I found a school that is as good as DePaul is academically. Mm -hmm. um, it was close to where I lived already, and so we didn't have to move. Um, I got, I got family and I got resources right here. Um, my parents only two hours away. My, my in-laws are 30 minutes away. So, um, I had kind of structural and family around me. And and so it really, it really allowed me to, to jump into it full time and to grow and develop. And obviously you're surrounded by great coaches. I've been surrounded by awesome mentors. Um, you know, when I, when I played in college, I was coached by Wayne Perry down at Hanover. Uh, Mike Leonard was a big influence in my life. Obviously Terry Peebles. Um, was mm -hmm. a big influence in my life as well. Great people, uh, great family men that do things the right way, that coach the right way. 
And then when I got to Hanover, frankly, I was, you know, Nick Morosis was here. Um, you know, Robbie Long's the guy that hired me, but Nick Morosis was here. He's the legendary head coach at DePaul from 1981 to 2003, but was still with us through 2017, 2018 season. And then, you know, Bill Lynch got hired in 2013 here, who's an Indiana football hall of famer. And so, mm -hmm. you know, was under him from 2013 to 2019 and just had surrounded by great people. So um, I've had some great mentors and role, role models in my life that say, Hey, this is, this could be a, a good life and a good job and a good occupation um, to keep doing this full time. Now I'm going to ask you about taking the reins in what is probably the craziest year and in, in most yeah. of our lives to the, to date. But my first question is, you know, you get there as a part-time coach in 2010. We're now sitting in 2024. I've got to remember to say that in your head a couple of times. Um, it, what has kept you at the park? for for the 14 seasons now in the different in the different aspects um that you know like you said there's a lot of people that you you don't stay a lot of people don't stay in a job five years six years unless they really do love it you clearly had the right people around you it's the right environment but what has really kept you in DePaul for these 14 years yeah DePaul's a special place I mean that's I could not be at a place this long if I really didn't believe in it. And I didn't think it'd be a, a great place for um, young men and women to come to, to get educated, to be part of a, a great alumni network and, and to truly come in and, and change themselves and, and come out better than, than when they came in. And I think at DePaul, I think it's the right mix of everything. Um, it's a little bit bigger campus for division three. Um, we've got awesome facilities. We got great administration um, you can win championships here, as we've proved mm -hmm. over the last few years. Um, but the people are awesome. The alumni are awesome. Uh, the Moanon Bell game is obviously a massive rivalry that you want to be a part of, and that that keeps me up at night. Um, so having something that still scares you, that still you know gets you gets you going every single day. Uh, but we can attract um, you know young men, obviously that I that I felt like what I was looking for in a college. I was looking for a, a spot that I could come and develop and play meaningful football games, but, but football wasn't 24 seven and our, yeah. our guys still get the chance to travel abroad. They still get great internships. They still get great jobs and they graduate and get out of this place that they truly can come here, still continue to, to play the game of football that they love, but they don't have to sacrifice much uh, when they come here. And so if you can get in a place uh, like DePaul that you really believe in that has history and tradition, you got support, you got facilities, you got alums that are crazy about this place that, that want to have you succeed. I mean, um, this is a place that just like Nick Morosis, you know, Nick, Nick was here from 1981 to, to 2003 and then stayed for, you know, an extra 15 years after that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think this is a place that that is very attractive to that. And, and so I'm, I was very fortunate to, to land the head job after uh, being a coordinator there uh, for a few years and and happy to still be here. Now, interesting enough, I, I hinted to it. You You take the reins in a time where. Uh, a lot of question marks going on, right? I mean, you're at that. I don't know exactly when you took the position in 2020, but I mean, we only have, we had like two months before the announcement comes out that everything's on hold. How does that, does that affect you in any way in your prep for your first year as a head coach? And, and how has that, you know, progressed to where we are today? Yeah. So a couple of things there. Obviously, being an internal candidate's got its own advantages and challenges, right? Um, and so being an internal candidate, I had basically a 10-year study session, a 10-year like ramp-up study of, of who DePaul was, what athletes would do well here, what coaches would do well here, what it takes to be successful in our league. And so when I took over, obviously, I had my own ideas, um, you know, from the coach Nick Morosis to the Bill Lynch, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of through that entire era. You know, DePaul has has had a, a great legacy um, and, you know, had 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 great values. Coach Nick coined the term Tiger Pride, and it has a lot that goes into that. And so we had an awesome base. We, we had a lot of really good things, and I, I didn't change um, a whole heck of a lot. But there were a couple things that I tweaked and changed and kind of put my own spin on it because, you know, talking to some really good coaches, you know, obviously I'm I'm. I was new as my first head coaching. So I talked to a lot of my mentor, my, my mentors and, Hey, you know, what's some advice or like, Hey, there, there's gotta be a way that, that you need to keep the tradition and history that DePaul has, but 
you need to make sure it's it's Brett Dietz's program and it's not a continuation of Bill Lynch's program. And so there were some things that I had to, to change and tweak um, and kind of put my own stamp on. Mm-hmm. Um, and honestly, the pandemic, as um, is, is, is awful as the pandemic was, ended up being a really positive thing for our football team because um, at the time I had a couple new coaches in here. Um, we had a, a really motivated senior class mm-hmm. um, that was ready to win a championship. It was a big senior class when I took over. They were excited um, that I was the head coach and they were mad that they that DePaul had sent them home, you know, and so they were highly motivated. And so when, when we came back, obviously we did a bunch of Zooms and, and tried to do some team building, but you know, I'm trying to get my program fired up. I had some new coaches. They're trying to get to know everybody. So naturally we did a, a little bit more on zoom and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe coaches that had been there and have been established, like we can't do anything. It sucks. Like it kind of froze them or helped stagnate or it was more energizing for us because everybody was trying to get to know everybody else. Nobody knew what to do. We came back that fall and DePaul had only invited freshmen and sophomores on campus and juniors and seniors were not invited back on campus. Wow. So basically that fall, we were allowed to practice probably 33 times. And it was really all our, all of our freshmen and sophomores. And so our staff, obviously we had COVID restrictions and what we could and couldn't do. Um, but because we handled that so well in the fall, our AD and, and our administration allowed us to play three games that spring. And so spring of, of 21, we we're allowed to play three games. So we played Worcester, we played Ohio Wesleyan, we played Greenville. Mm-hmm. Um, and not, we, we played more games than anybody in our conference. And so I, I talked to the seniors that year and remember they were not there in the fall. So they missed those 33 practices. So in the zoom talks, I said, Hey, we're going to have a three game season. They were excited. And I said, Hey, well, how do you guys want to handle this? Do you guys want it to be like practice a few days a week and, you know, kind of be a cool send off and have fun in the last three games. And they were like, no coach, we want to treat these three games. Like they're each a national championship game which gave me a lot of rain to be like, okay, because you guys want this now we can push in. So we brought back kids early for training camp and, you know, ahead of, of mm-hmm. our, kind of our second semester of what we had and everybody was back on campus that semester. So our guys were highly motivated. We, we had to practice in the morning because all the spring sports and all the fall sports were trying to practice. We had to practice in the morning. We had to practice in the indoor. We had to shovel snow off of our field. <laughs> um, there was a lot of crazy things we did that semester, but it was all, uh, very unifying and it was all very new and we kind of had a new staff and and I was trying to get this program started off right and so we treated those three games in the spring like they were Super Bowl every single week and so it, it kind of set an expectation and motivation for the young guys the seniors were great that year you know mm-hmm. they only got three games and kind of their senior we didn't have a lot of fifth year seniors come back a lot of them graduated went on and so those guys were awesome and, and kind of helped them start this thing and um, and then that spring was a pretty quick turnaround, you know, from the spring up until you know, the fall of 21. And, and we just really kept the momentum going. We had a lot of, of really good momentum um, and a lot of new confidence coming out of an undefeated, you know, spring as, as little as the three games were. I mean, our guys played it up. The coaches played it up like, hey, we just went undefeated. Yeah. So some of our players made undefeated national championship shirts because there was no national championship that year. And so we did the the UCF thing where, where our players said, Hey, we're national champions. So I like it. I like the confidence. Did, I like that. We had a lot of fun, but we, we, we pushed them hard and, and uh, try to just, you know, you know, if I could, if I could say anything, we just tried to turn over every stone and, and look at every corner of our program and just try to make sure that everything was, was tidied up. And, and mm-hmm. it was not a lot of big changes we had to make to kind of get over the edge. It was a lot of, it was just little things and little things we focused on and worked on and had some really good recruiting classes and and have the right coaches in here. And, and uh, you know, we've, we've been winning. And so um, coming out of the pandemic, I think the pandemic obviously really, really helped us and kind of reshape our new attitude and our new motto. And, and uh, so being a new coach, I think it it really kind of helped us that, that weird little transition. It gave us more time to kind of get the new, new way of thinking going and and uh so really fortunate with where we are today well and and it's interesting you say you said that the the guys came back and they were motivated uh and then not a lot of the fifth years come back but yet in the three years since nine and three nine and two ten and one so like you said there's there's some winning going on um obviously this year first round of the uh, of the of the big dance 
Um, before we get into that, though, I want to talk about the trip to Italy that we were supposed to talk about the last when we tried to when yeah. I, we had our mishap last year. So please, can you explain a little bit to my audience? Um, one, what that is, is that the, the division three schools get the opportunity to go travel to these these other countries and and you're almost an ambassador for the game of football pretty much. Yeah, right. For sure. Yeah. So what I, was I the think, trip like? Yeah. I, I think first the, the history of like the NCAA rules allows you to do, go once every three or four years. Okay. Um, that's kind of the NCAA rule. You can't do it every year. And so this is something DePaul, DePaul has a huge travel abroad culture um, mm-hmm. at our school. Um, a lot of our students end up traveling abroad. In fact, we're ranked in top five in the country as far as sending students abroad. Um, and so it really kind of matches with, with kind of what our school's made up of, um, and things like that. And so, you know, coach Lynch had the idea when he was a head coach, like, Hey, we, we need to do this. And he kind of had the contacts and we, we almost did it a, a several times while he was, uh, our head coach. And, uh, you know, and then when he ended up retiring at the end of 2019, you know, he didn't tell me to do anything with the program, but the one thing he did do is on that day, he was kind of his last day. He gave me that manila folder and he said, Hey, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but you should do this. And I opened it and it was all the travel abroad stuff that he said, Hey, you, you guys should go abroad um, in the spring, uh, take advantage. I think our, our, our kids are great fits for that. Um, and so it's something we sell a lot, you know, in recruiting anyway, that, that abroad is, is what a lot of our students end up doing and it's, it can mm-hmm. be a great additive experience. And so for us to do it, it's just a supernatural fit. And so we actually, I started it right when I became the head coach. Um, and then the, with the, with the COVID, you know, it really postponed it until this past really May. And so what we did it, we did it right after graduation. It was nine or 10 days. We let the players help decide where we're going. So we, we chose Italy. Uh, we went with global football. And uh, basically what it is, is you can go over there and you can play a game. You can play an international game. And so the way the NCAA rules are, are written, you can actually, you can get, you know, eight extra practices or so um, in full pads because you're getting ready to go play a game. It's not like mm-hmm. you're just going over there for to sightsee. So anyway, yeah, we went over, we went to right after graduation, we went over uh, for nine or 10 days. We went to, you know, the main stops were, were three main cities. It was Venice, Florence and, and Rome while we were over there. And we stopped on about day six of our nine day trip and we actually played a game. I mean, Ferrara. So we played a, a team in Ferrara. And again, just like you said it, you're not going over there for the competition. You're going over there for the camaraderie and the and a chance to share the game of football with somebody else. And so um, we played the game and and uh, afterwards they they cooked us a big meal and we we hung out, um, had some drinks with them and and uh, talked with the coaches and players. And and it's just cool seeing your players interact with with other people that love the game of football all the way across the um, all the way across the world when it's really mm-hmm. an American game. And, uh, but to see, find a group of Italians that are very passionate about football and the questions they'd ask you and the things they'd, they'd want to know are really, really interesting. So I think it was eye opening for our kids. One, because I, I would say, you know, maybe 75% of our team had not been out of the country before. So everybody's getting new passports and, and, uh, you know, this was kind of their first trip abroad. And mm-hmm. so we took about 75 players abroad. So it was, it was a big group. Um, wow. So we had coaches and players go, uh, but not every, every player went, um, but we had some parents go, um, our AD went. Um, and again, it was, it was a lot of sightseeing. It was a lot of being in, in new countries. We did one practice while we were there. It was a walkthrough on the beach um, on the, on like the first day we were there, uh, which was sweet. And then we played about day six and, and after the game, we ended up spending the last two days in Rome. So, um, we got to see Florence and Venice and uh, Bologna and, and uh, it, it was it was a really cool experience and something that um, our players were all really excited to do. And I think it's going to be part of their part of their lasting memories when they leave our school and leave our program is, is that trip we did last spring. So definitely plan on doing it again as soon as we're able to. Now, walk us through the 2023 season. So I there's a couple of things I just want for everybody that doesn't know. DePaul finished the year just outside of the D3.com top 25 receiving votes, but you were the number 21 team in the country, according to the coaches poll. Um, You also, and this goes back to the, the academic side of DePaul, seven academic all district and five guys made the D3.com all region team. Um, As I stated, you guys took it all the way to the, well, first the bell came home and then you played Alma in the first round of the dance. So let's 
let's unpack the season. What now that we've had had some time to reflect, how do you feel 2023 went? Yeah, I thought it was a overall it was a, a, a very a success, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, our seniors, I let our seniors kind of have some goal setting before the season starts. And, uh, you know, they really want to get to double digit wins. DePaul had never gotten to double digit wins in the history of the school. And we've been, you know, close the last couple of years. Uh, but we had we had bigger goals than that as well. But that was one of their their big goals. And and uh, so to go undefeated in the regular season, which hasn't happened since 1933 at DePaul, was it was a big deal. And so that's something our, our team is very proud of. But we definitely want to keep making it further, further the playoffs. And that was something that that our players were big on. They wanted to, to ruin Thanksgiving. So they wanted to be practicing on Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Um, that was another uh, big goal of theirs. And we didn't make it there. So I can't say all of our goals were accomplished, but we did. We did hit a lot of goals um, this year. Um, and so I think overall it was a success, but ultimately as we look forward, like we want to keep, keep increasing, uh, what we're trying to do and where we're trying to go. And, and I think Alma has, has really kind of set, um, the standard for, for what schools like us can do. Um, and I think, um, you know, they got it done this year and and they made it, you know, further than a lot of other teams had, had made it in a long time. And, that's what we wanted to do. And that's what we're, we're trying to do is, is to get kind of to that point in that level. And so, um, so, but we're never going to look past our schedule. Our conference is a great conference. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of really good teams there. Like we don't ever want to ever look past what, what we've done in conference. I mean, that's, that's always the big goal of ours is to win our conference, have a chance to go back to the playoffs and obviously win the Monon Bell game is, is a big goal for us as well. So, um, so I think overall it was a success, but it didn't end the way we wanted to. And I think we're, we're learning and we're understand that we, you're not going to get those opportunities every single year, that, that there's a lot of stuff that has to go right throughout the year to get to that point. And when we get to that point, um, we just, we just got to play better, you know, mm-hmm. um, we, we got to play better in that playoff game to, to get to where we got to go. Um, and so overall, but, but definitely a success. Now coach, can you put us in the room with a recruit or a recruits parents uh, and just give us kind of the idea of the conversation that you're having. Obviously, the guy got to be able to play ball, but that's not the only thing that you're looking for in a in a student athlete. So, is there how does that conversation go when you're sitting with a recruit? Yeah, I think that they we look for fits at DePaul. You got to be the right fit, um, and you know you want somebody that that wants to work just as hard in the classroom as they do on the field because DePaul's a hard school. So mm-hmm. if if you don't bring the right kid in and they don't have the expectation that school's going to be hard. It's not going to be great for you. It's not going to be great for the kid and the kid's not going to stay very long. So um, they really have to understand what they're really getting into um, when they come to a school like DePaul. And so, you know, I'm, I'm selling, I'm not just selling football. I'm selling the academics. I'm selling the alumni. Um, I'm selling our campus. I'm selling uh, the facilities where it, it's really kind of a whole package here because they got to fall in love with all of it. If they only fall in love with one part of it, then it's all going to crumble. Um, mm-hmm. And so they really got to know what they're getting into. And I think, you know, as big as a transfer portal is, it's so easy. And, and and not only is it easy for a kid to transfer, but the stigma is now gone, right? There, there's no yeah. stigma before when I played, like if you transfer, there's a little bit of a stigma with, Hey, why didn't it work out? Like, what are you, what are you going from? Right. And so now that stigma is not there because of how popular the portal is. Yeah. And so if, if you're selling the kid the wrong thing and and it's you're not being truthful and you're not being honest in the recruiting process and they get here and it's not what you what you said it was or it's not what your players say it was, then it's too easy for them just to to get out of there. So we really want to make sure that this is a four year decision uh, for these guys and they want to come and they want to get that degree just as much as they want to win a championship. Mm-hmm. And so for our guys that, that want to do both at a really high level, um, this can be a really good place for them. And so. Um, it's really just not recruiting the football side of them. It's recruiting the family. It's recruiting that, Hey, this is not only going to be a a great four years, um, while you're here and the experiences that you get to have while you're at DePaul. And obviously there's a lot that goes into that, right? The Italy trip and, and the academics and and the social Mm -hmm. life that we have on campus, but also now it's the winning the championship stuff. And so, you know, always thought, you know, at DePaul that you could, our guys could travel abroad, our guys could get internships. Our guys could still have plenty of job offers before their senior year started. Um, and you could still win championships while you're here. And we really hadn't done that much while I was here before. And now we have done that the past three years. And so now we're we're getting the football success with the academic success. And and families are seeing that. And uh, 
you know, it's, it's really about the whole picture. It's, it's not just the football picture. It's, it's the academic, it's the post-grad, it's the internships, the experiences you get to have while you're at DePaul. And so we're trying to paint that picture that we can do it better at DePaul than you can at, at any other place here um, in the Midwest. Now, coach, I've, I asked some coaches in the last season towards the end of the year, um, do you support the idea of the either the and I know it's a problem top division one all the way down right now. The conversation keeps happening. It, does the playoff system in division three need to be expanded? Does the regular season need to be expanded? How is there is that something that maybe we're, we need to pump the brakes on? Where, where do you fall in that whole debacle? I guess we call it. Yeah, I think it needs to be expanded. I, I think. You know, we're at 32 teams now. I mean, if they can find a way to get it to that 40 range or just a, we, we need some more at-large bids. Um, yeah. There's a lot of going to be deserving teams around the country every single year um, that just, man, they slipped up on one game, right? And they slipped up one game. I mean, how many 9-1 and one teams did not get to go yeah. and, and lost to really good teams? Teams ranked in the top 25. And, man, we didn't beat that one team, but they, they should probably get a – get a, a chance to go. And so I know that proposal is out there in the NCAA. I know the formula is messed up in football that we don't have enough opportunities for post-grad or, or for, for postseason play. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's out there and I would, I would support expanding the, the division three uh, playoffs. I, I just think, you know, having four at large bids is just not enough across the country. Um, I think the automatic qualifiers are huge because they give you something to play for so you can control your own destiny. So yeah doesn't matter what you did last year. If you were 0 and 10, you still have a chance to make the playoffs, regardless of, of what D3 football ranks you or what the coaches rank you, you know, you're going to have a chance to go to the playoffs if you win your conference. I think that's super important, um, which is obviously different than the college football committee and the top four spots there. But yeah, but having more at large bids that, that, so the committees can take, you know, non-conference championship winners, mm -hmm. um, they can go on and, and play in the playoffs, I think is, would be huge. Um, you know, there's a lot of high school teams that play a lot more than 10 games in a season. Um, but I'm not a huge advocate on, Hey, we need more regular season games. I just think they need to expand the D three playoffs a little bit mm -hmm. more, um, which I think would be the right answer and not, and not that, make it ridiculous, right? Not make it a 64 team tournament, but no, I like your 40. I think 40 is a good number for the amount of teams that are, yeah. that play. And you do, if you go off percentages, you're 28, 29, I think now this year will be 29 automatic bids. So you're yeah. actually going to lose an at-large bid. It, it yeah. just makes sense. You don't run into that same problem unless you, you know, and end up having 32 automatic bids, then we'll have to come back and talk about it again. But yeah, I mean, um, you need, you need 10 to 12, I think automatic bids are or, or 10 to 12 at-large bids um, with our playoffs, our size, and there, there's going to be enough there's going to be 10 to 12 enough deserving teams yeah, um, to have a chance to go. And if, and if the, and I'm not saying, Hey, we need to put the whole Wisconsin league in there either. Like, <laughs> I mean, you need to, for, for a team to make postseason play, it's a big deal in the division three level at any sport. And uh, I, I think that is huge to be part of an NCAA championship, a special. Um, and I think there, there needs to be more teams that, that need to feel that, but, but don't make it so big that it's diluted and, yeah, you know everybody makes it, but but having ten to twelve at large bids, I, I fully support. And then, so the follow up to that is, for you, what's the significance of Division three football and Division three athletics? Oh, that's a that's a big one. I think I, I obviously was a Division three athlete. I, I've spent most of my coaching career in Division three. Mm -hmm. um, I just think it's awesome because it, you get a chance to continue playing the game of football that you love, but a lot of division three schools um, are going to be more prestigious academically than a lot of D twos or NAIs um, and nothing against those schools or those levels. It's just, it's a little bit different that, um, you know, it's not as expensive for, for D three schools to have it. So a lot of the smaller school liberal arts schools that are great schools, they have great alumni networks, great uh, educational experience, much like I had, you know, they're going to fall to D three. I mean, that's, the, the non-scholarship thing is not going to be as expensive. It's it's very expensive to have a scholarship football program for a school. Mm -hmm. And, but to have that experience, I think is, is very valuable, whether you get a scholarship to play or not is huge, but also to understand that, Hey, our, our football that we play, 
I, I feel like it's just as passionate. I feel like our kids care just as much as they do um, at the division one level. Um, it's just somebody's getting their education paid for or partially paid for it. And, and some aren't, but I don't think that diminishes our, our experiences. I don't think it diminishes um, their worth or their value to the game and things like that. So, um, so I think D3 is, is families that, Hey, I, this, he, we want to pursue football. We want to continue. And the kid is, wants to continue playing football, but they also understand that, Hey, football is not going to be my life. It's I'm not making it to the NFL. You know, I want to go to a school like DePaul. I want to do internships. I want to travel abroad. I want to be part mm -hmm. of a great alumni network. I want to go to DePaul because I want to be part of your football program. I want to have a great experience while I'm doing it. When I graduate, I want that degree to mean something. I want that school to help me get to where I want to go in life. And so um, I think the D3 experience from an athletic standpoint is a lot more than just athletics. I think it has to do with the the, the four-year experience while you're here, but also the, the post-grad stuff as well. So um, I think it's, it's a lot more than than your your athletics, but I think that athletic experience is super valuable. Coach, you're setting the bar pretty high for the first episode with that answer. Everybody else behind you now has to have a good answer like that. I mean, 2024 is we're, we're stepping our game up, you know. So Dingo Talks so, got to bring it bring it with us. So we're now at the point we got our five random questions for you. Let's go. Um, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Oh boy. Um, I'm gonna have to go. I'll go Hilton Head. Um, I'll go Hilton Head because it's got personal significance uh, to me. Um, it's where my family um, has gone really for the past, you know, 10, 15 years on vacation. Um, so when I think of Hilton Head, I think of relaxing. I think of family time. I think of vacation. Um, I think of, uh, you know, important R&R. &R, um, mm -hmm. And I think my family is very important to me. So um, that's not a very well thought out answer, but, but I, I like to spend a lot of time in Hilton Head. So I'm going to go with that right now. Where did you meet your wife? Hanover. We were both Hanover college athletes. Okay. Um, so she was a, a college basketball player. And, and, uh, and so we met there and, and uh, yeah, my sister, ironically, my sister also went to Hanover and also married another Hanover athlete. So we got two sets of Hanover athletes, uh, couples in our, my immediate family. What's the most important lesson that you've learned over your career? Man, how, 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 I can't come up with it that quick. It um, <laughs> doesn't have to I, be a quick answer. You can take a second. And... <laughs> I'm with you. Lightning round. I thought it was going to be like one word, like, okay. um, I mean, I think it's, it's to make an impact where you're at, um, to be happy where you're at to, to really, I mean, this, especially the football stuff, you can get so caught up in looking at what's next. And what's next and where am I going to go and where my where's my career going to go that sometimes it's hard to stop and smell the roses and and figure out where you're at. And so um, I've had a lot of, like I said, great mentors um, in my life that have have been pretty satisfied uh, with, with where they're at and, and would have other opportunities to be able to go places and and things like that. But but to be able to, to appreciate what you have and, and to understand that grass is not always greener on the other side. Um, I think is an important, important life lesson. Um, it's something that I've, I've learned. I've had to kind of apply and I'm kind of living it right now. And, and, uh, you know, life, life can be pretty good right where you're at. If you weren't coaching, what would you be doing and why? I'd have to be doing something in sports, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, golf is, is another passion of mine. Um, I love the game of golf. Um, and even though golf is my main hobby, you know, you don't want to make your hobby your job because then it becomes your job and not your hobby. But but I guess I'm going to have to say I'd have to be doing something with sports, hopefully golf or football um, at the end of the day, because those are two of my passions. Um, but I, I, I'd still think I'd have to be surrounded uh, by some kind of sports. Makes sense. Makes sense. So this is a two parter. Uh, it's the second to last question. Best okay. compliment you've ever received. Ooh. Best compliment I've ever received. Um, I'd say somebody wants to describe me as fast and nobody ever that's seen me play described me as fast. So I've always kind of remembered that from back from high school. Um, and somebody said, man, that quarterback you had is pretty fast. And I was like, is he talking about me? So I got to blush at that one. So that was, that's one that's always kind of stuck out that, um, 
you know, that has to do with more of my athletic um, skills. But I think, you know, any compliment <clears throat> about our team now is is awesome because, you know, being in the position I am, you know, where I've been, you know, it's definitely not about you. There, there's so many things that go into the whole machine, right? And the head coach yeah. is, is oftentimes gets too much credit and gets too much blame. Um, but it's, man, it's such a big machine that, that a lot of things have to go right. And so, you know, anytime we leave a hotel, right. And the hotel employees will stop us and say, Hey, you guys are the best football group we've ever had in here. Your, your kids are polite. Your kids are nice. They've, you know, cleaned up chairs, you picked up trash, you know, you left the place better than when you found it. I think always brings me joy um, to hear compliments about our team like that. Um, and obviously whether it's on the field or off the field, I think, um, being the head coach of a program, knowing that it's not all you, but there's a lot of other people that go into it. Any compliment you get, whether it's about a coach or a player, you know, just brings you joy. It's, it's kind of like, I'm, I'm proud Papa, you know, I'm a, I'm a dad now. And same thing, any time you get compliments about your own kids, like it just kind of brings your own heart joy, knowing that, that you were, you know, definitely were not the whole part of it, but, but you're, <laughs> you're had a little bit of hand in, in that, um, just brings me a lot of joy. So. And then on the other side of compliments, what's the best insult you've ever received? Oh, (laughs) Um, so I can't think of a specific insult, but I'll tell you when I played arena football, the hardest stadium that I ever played in was in the arena football championship game. My last championship game I ever played, I played in Spokane, Washington. Okay. Um, I played the Spokane shock and those fans were relentless and they were harsh, and I don't remember anything specifically that they said, but it was relentless the entire game. And I remember it. I remember it because um, they're in arena football; they are right on top of you, mm-hmm. so you can hear a lot of a lot of things. Um, but I always remember that being the, the hardest environment that we've ever played in, um, that I've ever played in personally, just because it, it wasn't one thing here or there, or after a touchdown you threw or an interception. It was the entire game that were just on me. Um, and so I had to, we got on the bench, I had to go back and hide in the tunnel. So I got earmuff. Little... You had to earmuff it so that you couldn't, we were going to get, yeah. gonna get some peace. Yeah. So I wouldn't say it was any one insult, but it was a barrage of, of heckling. Uh, it was the hardest environment I had to play in. So I would say the 2010, uh, arena bowl, um, would be my answer there. And then the last question, uh, was there a question that you were expecting me to ask you? And if so, how would you have answered it? <laughs> oh, I figure I I'll, make you so the, I, I'll make you the host now. So I got to come up with the question. <laughs> and uh, if there was one, if you weren't expect, I've had people say they weren't expecting anything. So. Yeah. I mean, I did a little research when we were supposed to do this uh, last year. Um, but honestly, coming into this, I was like, man, I'll be, I'm going to, He'll, he'll ask some great questions and things like that, but um, best piece of advice. I thought you were, you were going to ask me and you did. So, um, so I, I go with that one. So I, I, I guess I came in with little expectations then other than the, the advice question. So. All right, coach. Well, I want to say thank you very much for being our first guest of season four. Um, best of luck to you this year. And hopefully this time next year, you and I, having a conversation after after the stag bowl and, and Let's do it. i i think we should if we we'll, we'll, we'll put you down as a, as a return guest and and we'll be talking outside of salem i believe unless we're moving it again this year then wherever you know, it is we'll go we'll be there if it's if, if they're moving it we'll go so i appreciate right, you having me on this is fun thank you very much and for those of you sticking around we're going to overtime with serenity brown she's got some football questions so that she can learn the game a little bit more Uh, So that when we're picking games, she doesn't get picked on by the audience for maybe not picking a team that she should have. So I'm Carla Guadagnino. This has been the head football coach of DePaul University, Coach Brett Dietz. And we'll be right back, Chuckleheads. What's going on, Chuckleheads? Welcome back to Overtime with Serenity Brown. That's Serenity Brown. I'm Carla Guadagnino. It's the first one of the season. Yes, it is. So we want to welcome you back to our little segment here. Uh, leading into trying to get the predictions down again, we're going to, one, this episode will be touching base on what Serenity knows about football. Uh, and then throughout the summer, 
spring ball air time will be she's going to ask questions we're going to try to i'm going to try to facilitate the answers if you guys hear something that she says and you want to chime in with an answer because we know everybody likes to play monday night quarterback or backseat driver or whatever you want to call it so if you think that you have the answer for her please be more we're more than willing to listen to what you have to say that being said i can thank coach deets and DePaul for joining us um interesting guy they he's he really loves the fact that the pause like their thing is students can travel abroad and whatnot and he was very uh, much wanting to talk about that they went on a trip to Italy last year uh, so, he, so cool. <laughs> he filled us in a little bit on you know what that process is like and how the NCAA really like they they push teams to do that I think you have I think you have to wait before you go again I think there's like a two-year waiting period or, or, or whatnot um, but there it's basically you're an ambassador for the game of football and for your specific university going to another Which country. Really cool, and I think that's kind of really unique too. So, Never heard about so like far, that. you know, season three, we had Coach Sirianni with WNJ. They had taken a trip. Originally, when we talked to Coach Dietz, we scheduled him last year uh, for to talk about the trip as they were coming back from Italy. Uh, schedules got a little yeah. rambled and. Uh, so that being said, also make sure you're uh, paying attention to that first segment as we're trying to give recruits, parents, and anybody else that's interested a little bit more background information on the schools and the, well, specifically on the schools that we're talking about. The coaches are going to talk about their program and their journey. Uh, but all that's out of, I think that's all the clerical work. I think so. I miss anything? Social medias. Yeah, you guys know them. If you've been here long enough, you know what they are. If not, type in Dingo Talk onto any of your social media platforms, except it. for the Instagram page. You just got to put an underscore in between the Dingo and the Talk. That being said, first question for you: What do you know? What do you know about the game of football? Let's let's go that. That's a pretty broad question. Yeah, it's a pretty broad question, and I'm gonna be honest with you. It's hard to answer that question just like not Would watching you... it like if i were to like sit there and actually watch the game i can follow it mm -hmm. i for the most part understand what's going on um there's certain like calls i don't understand there's certain rules i don't understand there's certain posi there's well, most of the positions i don't really understand i know what they're called and i but i don't i know what the quarterback does I don't really know what any of the other ones do. <laughs> so I think let's can we can we do it this way? Let's start this week with just a broad overview of the offense, and then next week we'll come out. We'll broad overview the defense, and then we'll kind of mix and match and get into other things. Does that work? Yeah, I mean, like I know offense is well. You know the big the big manager. The offense's up front. job is to get the a touchdown. touchdown. Mm -hmm. The defense's job is to stop the other team from getting a touchdown. Okay. That's where that. That's, that's where it ends. Line. That's where that. You ends. you understand ten yards gets you a first down for every ten yards until you get to. I didn't know. I I knew that there was a certain distance. I didn't know how long so the distance was. So. Ten yards, first and ten, automatically. You, oh, that makes more sense. That's why it's now. first and ten. <laughs> yeah, that makes more sense. Now you can okay. get a penalty on first down, holding penalty, etc. Could be first and twenty. Could be first and fifteen. Depends on what the penalty is assessed and if the coach decided to accept the penalty. Uh, let's take. I'm going to take you down the list. So you know the big guys up front. Yeah. There's five guys. You got two tackles, two guards, and a guy that snaps the ball to the quarterback, the center. Jason Kelsey, for those of you watching. It's good to be able to attach. You don't know who Jason is. I know who Jason Kelsey is. Why he's do you on, know who Jason is? He's, he's uh, Why on the Eagles, you, right? We don't know. He may have oh, retired. Yeah, he may, may have, have retired, retired. May not have. Really Adam know. Schefter really pissed a lot of people off because he announced it. Second year in a row he's done that. Caused a big storm. Hey, but, don't ask me, oh, how do you know? Because, well, you, you, listen, he's going to be like, oh, it's because of Travis Kelsey. It's Travis Kelsey. I was, Taylor Swift. No, I knew about those two before Taylor Swift started dating Travis. Actually, let's talk so, about, wait, let's talk about the football queen herself, and that's Miss Kaylee Kelsey, who is the, I don't give, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't give a shit about Taylor Swift. That woman is a, is a genius for getting herself a man like, Jason Kelsey, who was almost the damn best-looking man of the year. Instead, McDreamy became it, and that's a whole nother story. You All right, already we're said getting that's off this real. topic. All right, so you got your five up front. 
Those are your that's basic sets. That's what you're going to get. Two tackles, two guards, guy in the center. Then you have your quarterback, which you know. Then you have your running backs. Now, yeah. you have a couple different types of things. You could have an, an I formation, which is going to give you a fullback and a running back. Just means that center, quarterback, and then right behind them, there'd be two guys lined up. Fullback normally puts his hand on the ground. Running back normally, hands on the hips. Wait, right behind you, follow your lead blocker. Uh, tight end, Travis Kelsey. Normally on the line, a lot of the times though, you can t if he's going to become a receiver, you can take you take him off the line. That's way deep into it. You got two receivers normally, sometimes three, depending on what offensive set you're running, and then each one of those can be interchangeable. You could have a slot, which just means instead of being way way out as a wide receiver, you're more inside. Uh, yeah, see, there's there's he's moving throwing, parts. He's throwing a lot at me right now. Uh, this is the first episode. Guys. We're gonna we're gonna get there. <laughs> I'm just I'm giving you a broad overview. That was broad. I could have way I could have I could have loot or came way in. That was a lot to be thrown at. On offense, what are some things that you would like to know for next week? Do you want to know about penalties? Do you want to know about run play versus pass play? What are you yeah, looking? Yeah, I don't understand like. Plays. Like, I understand, like, the run versus pass. A pass. Obviously. obviously, it's easy to know. But, like, besides that, I don't understand, like, different plays or anything. Like, I want to let you guys know that actually, majority of what I learned about football is because he taught me how to play the video game. He did, Madden. Um, she can't play offense, she can only play defense. Yeah, I can't do it. Uh, so, it's too many moving parts. I wish I was kidding, but that's <laughs> not what it is. She she literally money. tried to play offense one time, and I can't do this. There's too many people. No, 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 no. I didn't freak out. I was not good at it. Hockey, playing hockey was the one I was really, really, I freaked out. Uh, that was the easiest way for me to learn. So that's how we decided to do it. So, I, have an, I have one other follow-up question, and then. Yeah. Uh, so we got to what you know. Mm -hmm. Check that box off. Uh, we were going to ask you what you learned last year, but that's a lot to like try to call back because yeah. we did do a lot. We met a lot of different teams, a lot of different coaches. And it was just it was so much. I was at that point, I had two jobs. Yeah. And now very we, undersleeping. we got to what you want to know. So next week, when we when we come into this segment, we'll be covering what you wanted to know and then giving you a little bit more. So you're going to have a little homework. Ain't that a mm. bitch? And then. I thought I was done with school. Uh, my question for you as someone who went through the process, not necessarily, you went through the recruitment process of picking a school and whatnot, and that's mm -hmm. kind of what we're trying to help with. How important have you, f do you feel from hearing the coaches from season three, how important is football to the recruitment process for a college? Extremely. There's a lot of kids who want to continue playing football after high school and they look to do that and if they want to do that and they don't like your program they're gonna leave your school mm -hmm. so it's it's good for those students to know about your program i agree plus you know you get a you get an education behind it especially yeah, I mean. <laughs> at the d3 level you you get to continue playing with the sport that you love to play whether that be football basketball baseball we cover football here um but you also get that opportunity but, but, to get a high-end education. Yeah, but with that, like, you can get an education. Without it. And, like, anywhere. So for those kids who want to continue on, like, with football, they it's need important. to find it. It's an important part to, to find a team that they're going to fit in with. Mm -hmm. So it's it's good to have the tool of kind of getting to know what that coach is like and what that team is like before committing to it. I'm going to throw one more question I want you to look into here as we take a week. Okay. I want to, I want you to look into what the transfer portal is. Um, I... A little bit. Yeah, I heard a little bit of that. Okay. And I'd like... I just want to get your reaction to how that is next week, obviously. But okay. Like how that is affecting recruitment because that's something we talk about with the coaches as well. Uh, got anything else that you would like to 
How do you feel this season's going to go for you picking? I mean, obviously it's episode one. Um, better, worse, or push? Maybe better, maybe the same. Uh, I don't, I'm hoping I don't do worse. <laughs> I will not be continuing for a fifth season <laughs> Do worse. No, I'm kidding. Um, wow, so we had it. We just had a contract negotiation <laughs> while we're here. She's apparently threatening if she does not do well in this year's predictions, she will not uh, be back. For no, a I just season. said if I do worse. <laughs> um, but it's, I can't see myself doing worse. I could see myself maybe doing better just because last year I just straight up i had i didn't know any research on teams i didn't know is that a plan this win year? records were I, I didn't know anything so i kind of was just like i see the two names i'm going off my gut feeling oh i kind of know that team's name i'm going with them um the gut really did not help you sometimes sometimes it did. Just other times. A lot of times other it did times not. So. Um, as always, we want to take a moment. Thank you for watching and listening. Check out our socials. Make sure you subscribe or hit the like button uh, wherever you're listening to us at. And we'll catch you next week, Chuckleheads. Thanks for checking out this episode of Dingo Talk. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. For more info and to contact the show, you can find us on Twitter at Dingo Talk.